Good afternoon, and thank you for tuning in to the Government of Newfoundland and Labrador's COVID-19 News Conference. I'm Nancy Hollett with the Department of Health and Community Services, and I'm the moderator of today's question and answer session. Joining us today is the Honorable John Hagee, Minister of Health and Community Services, and Dr. Janice Fitzgerald, Chief Medical Officer of Health. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, thank you for taking time out of your afternoon to join us. Um, I will uh, throw things over to uh, Dr. Fitzgerald for her uh, update. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. Good afternoon. Uh, there are 17 people hospitalized due to COVID-19 severity, and there have been 206 new recoveries, leaving 1,902 active cases in the province. Since the update yesterday, we're reporting 287 new confirmed cases of COVID-19 in the province, 177 in Eastern Health, 45 in Central Health, 56 in Western Health, and nine in Labrador Grenfell Health. 1,403 tests were completed since yesterday. Based on several indicators, such as our active case count, increased PCR testing, and wastewater testing, we are seeing an increase in COVID activity. This is to be expected as restrictions ease. Despite this, our hospitalization rate has remained relatively stable in the last few weeks and well within manageable levels. We are therefore proceeding to lift more restrictions next week while we continue to closely monitor indicators. So effective 12.01 a.m. Monday, February 28th, formal gatherings are limited to 75% of venue capacity. There, there are some changes for faith-based and cultural ceremonies. Those that require proof of vaccination are limited to 75% capacity. Those that do not require proof of vaccination are limited to 50% capacity. Uh, but in those uh, situations, congregational singing will be permitted um, as of Monday. Public visitations will be limited to 75% capacity per room and wakes held outside of a funeral home or place of worship remain limited to 25 people as per the limit for informal gatherings. Bars, lounges, cinemas, performance spaces and bingo halls will be limited to 75% capacity and eating or drinking is only permitted while seating and masks may only be removed when eating or drinking while seated. Dance floors are permitted, however, masks must be worn while dancing. As clarification, retail establishments can operate at full capacity without distancing, but masks must be worn. As we reopen further, more people will inevitably be exposed to COVID-19 and repeated cycles of isolation will no doubt have an impact on mental health, families, workplaces, and the functioning of society as a whole. We are therefore changing the guidance for close contacts effective tomorrow. This will apply to everyone regardless of occupation and any contacts currently isolating without symptoms can transition to the new guidance tomorrow. There are a lot of details and if then scenarios in this new guidance. So all this information will be on our website and it will include detailed instructions on testing with options for both rapid and PCR testing. I'll outline the key changes now. So if you're a household contact, if you have someone in your household with COVID-19 and you are fully vaccinated without symptoms, you can follow modified isolation for five days with testing. So modified isolation means the contact can work can attend work, school, daycare, after school programs, but must otherwise isolate. The requirements are different for household contacts that have no symptoms but are not fully vaccinated, such as children under five, and they must fully self isolate for seven days with, with testing. This is a shorter isolation period than the current requirement of 10 days. If you have had a COVID infection in the last three months, you do not need testing and only isolate if you develop symptoms and you can leave isolation when your symptoms are improving. For non-household contacts, so anyone that is an asymptomatic non-household contact is not required to self-isolate or test, but for seven days after last contact with the person who has COVID, they must monitor for symptoms, wear a mask outside their home and avoid a high risk areas unless it is for work. If you develop symptoms, of course, then you, uh, should uh, get tested and isolate. Any symptomatic non-household contact must fully self-isolate and 
follow testing instructions. And if they test negative, they can stop isolating when symptoms have improved with no fever for at least 24 hours. If you have been exposed to someone with COVID-19 and have questions as a first step, please visit our website and review the flowchart. You can also use the self-isolation tool and input your individual circumstances to get specific guidance. And if you still have questions, please email COVID19info at gov.nl.ca. Please do not call 811 unless you have a health concern and you need advice from a registered nurse. We are making changes to our online application to book a PCR test. It will now be called the Online Self-Assessment and Test Reporting Tool and will allow people to report their positive rapid test result. This is voluntary. We have several indicators that help us gauge the level of COVID activity, and this will complement those, those um, measures. It's one more tool in our toolbox to help us determine trends. So if we certainly ask that anyone who has a, a positive test uh, result, uh, please, please do use that portal to report it. You can report a positive test regardless of where you obtained your rapid test, either if it could be through school, travel, or private laboratory, um, but you can only report your result if you tested positive in the last 10 days. Uh, and that time limit is in place to ensure only recent and active cases are provided direction on testing. As travel restrictions are lifted provincially and continue to ease globally, we recognize that more people will look to travel outside of the country. If you require proof of a COVID infection for the purpose of travel and you do not qualify for a PCR test through the provincial health system, you must arrange for a test through private laboratories. Each country has, has different requirements regarding pre-arrival testing and proof of recent infection. Uh, so the onus is on the traveler to research the policies for that destination. Public health and 811 cannot provide that information. As we begin to the transition out of restrictions, we will be looking at changing the frequency of reporting. So make no mistake, we will continue to be transparent in regular reporting. Epidemiological trends are an important tool for public health surveillance, but daily counts have less value than they did in the past. And case counts are no longer as good an indicator of risk, and they don't really tell you where COVID is at this time. So. Anytime we interact with others, there's that potential for COVID exposure. So each of us has the power to reduce the risks for ourselves and for others, even when restrictions are lifted. These are the simple measures we know so well, such as wearing your mask, distancing, hand washing, and staying home when you're sick. They all greatly reduce the risk of COVID-19 transmission. And of course, being vaccinated remains a very important way to reduce the risk of spread and protect yourself from severe illness. We have been living with some form of pandemic restrictions for almost two years, but the restrictions were not meant to be forever. They were necessary to respond to the more severe COVID strains, but Omicron is different and hence our response is different. It's time to move out of crisis mode and begin a more sustainable approach to managing COVID-19 while we were able to do so. So when restrictions are lifted, testing, isolation, vaccination, and personal protective measures, including masking, will continue to be an important part of this approach. Monitoring the evolution of the virus will continue to be a priority for public health, and no one knows with certainty what the future will bring for COVID-19. Whatever that future is, I am certain that the people of our province will show the same cooperation, determination, and resilience that they have from the beginning. So take care, everyone, and hold fast, Newfoundland to my door. Thank you. Back to you, Minister. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Fitzgerald. I should have opened by apologizing to those uh, viewers who were expecting uh, sign language interpreters. Unfortunately, uh, there was a scheduling conflict when we uh, uh, shifted our availability. Um, uh, there's a lot to absorb here today. Uh, these are all based on sound public health advice and uh, uh, I would refer people to the website. It will be updated later on today. Uh, some of those changes, particularly around isolation, uh, take effect uh, shortly after midnight. Uh, the others uh, will come into force on, on Monday. Um, I want to say a little bit about the easing of restrictions uh, over the coming uh, week. Uh, on Monday, uh, all provincial travel restrictions will be lifted, again, on the advice of public health. 
we know that the virus is endemic here. It's everywhere. And the biggest uh, source is probably the people in the province rather than necessarily travellers uh, because of the uh, travel policies uh, of uh, the airlines in terms of vaccination. Um, regardless of their vaccination status, uh, we are not going to require travellers coming in uh, provincially uh, to self-isolate, complete COVID-19 testing, or complete the travel form. And the travel website uh, will, uh, the travel form website will be taken down on Monday. So we won't be handing out rapid test kits any further uh, to travellers at the Marine Atlantic Ferry uh, or Port of Basque, uh, or indeed the, um, the airports. And we're going to remove our border screeners at that point and allow them to go back to uh, their more usual roles uh, within uh, uh, fisheries, forestry and agriculture. Uh, domestic travellers entering the province will not need to show any particular documentation before or upon arrival. They are still strongly encouraged to follow public health measures such as have been outlined in the past. Um, physical distancing, mask wearing, hand washing and good uh, cough and sneeze hygiene. These all still have an extremely important role. Uh, international travellers, of course, will be subject to any federal requirements. Uh, and I would encourage, as Dr Fitzgerald has done, uh, for travellers to check the Government of Canada website for that. It's important to remember that our epidemiology drives uh, our decisions and we'll continue to monitor that to see if our decisions need to change. Um, mask wearing, as I've said, remains strongly recommended. Uh, I would reiterate Dr Fitzgerald's comment that 811 is for people who require medical advice for illness uh, and the services of a registered nurse or a nurse practitioner. It is not for clarity around these COVID changes. For that, uh, you use COVID-19 info at gov.nl.ca. Also want to take time just to provide an update on Paxlovid, um, the antiviral treatment uh, designed to reduce uh, the risk of hospitalization. Um, we have dispensed 20 treatment courses uh, over the course of their availability, 14 in Eastern, three in Labrador Grenfell, and three in Western. Uh, none of those uh, taking the course uh, have uh, been hospitalized because of COVID. Yesterday was Pink Shirt Day, and it's a time we use to draw attention to anti-bullying uh, and really use it to emphasize the importance of kindness. Um, and whilst really starting with students and youth, I think it's important to remember that as adults and as Newfoundlanders and Labradorians, um, each of us will adjust to these changes at our own pace. And I think as we do move to our new normal, we've got to respect that that process may take some time longer for some people than others. And I think in that period, we should treat others with kindness. Uh, final comments are around the healthcare system. Uh, Dr. Fitzgerald has said that our healthcare system is able to manage the current level of hospitalization. However, work isolation, uh, sorry, isolation policies uh, have actually now driven uh, 1,030 healthcare workers uh, to uh, self-isolate. And only a few of those are doing so in work isolation policies. With these changes that we see now, uh, we would expect uh, an influx of um, uh, asymptomatic, fully vaccinated individuals back into the healthcare system to help manage uh, as we transition from um, the lower case counts we've seen before to the kind of endemic approach we have at the moment. Um, with that, I really... Uh, um, only comment that the um, issue about changing releases uh, will be uh, uh, elaborated, will be explained over the course of next week. Uh, and part of that will also be to redesign our hub to reflect um, current practices across the country so we're more aligned, but also to provide ready access to information between less frequent news releases. So with that, uh, Nancy, I'll, I'll pause and hand it back to yourself to moderate the question and answer period. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Today, we have six reporters joining us. The first round of the question and answer session will give each reporter the opportunity to ask one question and one follow up. There will then be a final round where each reporter will have the opportunity to ask one final question. Our first questions today are from Andrew Waterman with The Telegram. Andrew, please go ahead. 
Good afternoon. Thanks for taking our questions. Um, with the requirements of vaccination or proof of vaccination, uh, rather, uh, and, and masks and that sort of thing, uh, more than likely being dropped if all goes according to plan next uh, in March. Um, I'm wondering if businesses can continue to use uh, these things. Can it, is it legal for them to, to require proof of vaccination? Um, so speaking to the legality of it, I, I can't really uh, speak to that. Certainly we would encourage and we're strongly recommending that everybody wear masks uh, even after the 14th of March. It's a, uh, there's a difference between you know, strongly recommending them and having them required uh, by uh, special measure order. Um, so, uh, and any, uh, as we saw, even before we brought in mask mandates, uh, you know, there are, if a business, is, business des decides they want to require a mask for entry, that is allowed, uh, you know, that is within their, within their realm to do that. So, uh, you know, we certainly support any business who wants to uh, continue to require masking uh, for people to go into their uh, into their premises and uh, uh, we certainly strongly recommend that everyone else does as well. Um, with regard to the proof of vaccination though I think I'd have to defer the answer to that one. Um, I don't know Minister if you have any more information than I do. I think you've covered it Dr Fitzgerald. I mean I can't comment on the legalities. What I am aware of is that private businesses uh, are free, as Dr. Fitzgerald says, to uh, to set their own requirements for patrons. Uh, thanks. Uh, um, so uh, I've been speaking with some parents of children under five uh, who are nervous about their, you know, the fact that their kids uh, can't get vaccinated yet and that we're opening up. Uh, can you explain how rare or how common it is for kids in this age group to get to have like serious illness? And is it fair at this point to say it would be more akin to something like the flu or, or a cold? Um, so I think, uh, you know, certainly what we're seeing is that I know that there's been some, you know, there's been lots of the news about, uh, you know, there are more hospitalizations in this age group than ever before. But I think you have to remember there's been more infections than ever before. And that's, you know, whenever you see infections go off, regardless if there's a if there's a percentage of people who will get hospitalized, uh, then that's going to happen. And the more people you have, um, the the more hospitalizations you'll see. And um, so, it's. Uh, but what we're seeing still is that the risk of hospitalization in this age group is still very, very low. If we look at the number of people who are hit in hospital compared with the number of children who are infected, that number appears to be quite low. Generally speaking, uh, you know, for the most part, even children uh, who are young, they, uh, when they're getting admitted, it appears that they're developing symptoms very similar to uh, croup or bronchiolitis, which are conditions that we see quite frequently every winter in children. And, uh, and they do seem to be responding well to traditional therapies for those, for those uh, problems. So uh, children do seem to be faring well if they end up in hospital, uh, but the risk of hospitalization is still uh, quite low in that uh, age group in general. Thank you very much. Our next questions are from Peter Cowan with the CBC. Please go ahead, Peter. Dr. Fitzgerald, you've talked about uh, the fact that individuals are now going to have to assess their own risk uh, as we remove some of the restrictions. What do you say, though, to people who are concerned about the fact that we're now going to provide them with less information about how much COVID is in the community at a time where we're expecting them to make their own decisions? So I think the amount of COVID that's in the community, it, you know, we have to assume that COVID is, is anywhere and everywhere. Um, and so um, knowing the exact number of cases in a day is not going to change that. Um, you know, we, knew, we do need to, um, to take those precautions on a regular basis. And I think going forward, you know, we will still be reporting um, those numbers. They're not going to go away Completely. We're just not going to be doing it every day. Um, and uh, so I think people certainly, for the most part, have the information that they need. They know that COVID is out there. They know that it, uh, you can uh, get it from pretty much anywhere if you're around people who are not your regular uh, group. And uh, especially, and even if they're, they are your regular group, you know, if you're around people who are masking, people can come into contact with this almost anywhere now. So, you know, we have to, uh, we have to take those precautions on a regular basis if we're going out. 
um, and make those risk assessments for us. So um, the actual precise numbers every day, I don't think changes that at all. And a question about the new isolation rules. Um, as the minister pointed out, and this will mean that more healthcare workers um, who might have family members who are sick with COVID are now able to go back into the hospital to work. Dr. Fitzgerald, how would you address concerns that people may have that you know their sick, elderly, vulnerable loved ones are now being cared for by people who are at higher risk to have COVID themselves? Yeah, so I mean, that's certainly I understand the concern that's coming from that. And, uh, uh, but there's two sides to that coin, right? It's, it's okay, there's a risk of COVID, but then there's the risk of not getting the care that you need because we don't have enough workers to be able to provide that care. So, um, you know, we've looked at this very carefully. The, uh, the people who, who are household contacts are, they are getting tested. So it's not without any precaution. So we are checking for COVID and anybody obviously that tests positive is gonna be uh, in isolation. Um, so uh, it's, not, it's not completely just back to work without any, uh, without any checks. In addition to that, of course, all workers are wearing um, appropriate PPE. They're wearing masks. Uh, to prevent transmission. And we know that masks are quite effective in helping us reduce transmission of COVID. So there are, um, there are those precautions uh, in place. And, uh, and of course, at any point, if anyone develops symptoms, then they are to isolate. Thank you. Our next questions are from Ben Cleary with uh, NTV. Ben, please go ahead. Hi, and uh, good afternoon. Uh, my first question is for Dr. Fitzgerald, and that's just, uh, can you kind of elaborate on the, the increase in cases that we've seen since easing restrictions, and is the rise in cases kind of something that public health predicted? Yeah, so we're seeing um, a slight increase. You know, we were um, down less than 200 cases a day for a little while, and now we're just sort of in the middle between two and three, but somewhere between 220 to 50 cases um, a day. And, and so that isn't unexpected. Obviously, when we open things up and people have more contact with each other uh, in situations where they may not be wearing a mask for whatever reason, uh, you know, we know that we're going to see um, spread of this. Uh, our goal with all of this is to stop, is to keep that spread at a manageable level. And, and we feel that even with this increase in, in cases, we are seeing a manageable level of spread at this point. Uh, thank you. And my next question is for Minister Haggy, and that's uh, Minister uh, Lee Evans has raised concerns about the medevac service in Labrador. Uh, she says there have been incidents where COVID patients in Labrador have had trouble getting transported to St. John's. Uh, could you respond to this? Certainly, uh, we hear of challenges with the air ambulance, uh, particularly in Labrador, uh, and between uh, the, the challenges that existed before COVID and the extra demands, it, it has produced delays uh, for some patients. And again, it's winter in Labrador. Um, I think uh, having said that, um, these individuals are able to access virtual care between the physician on site and the physician in uh, the referral center that's accepted them. Uh, and so it's not as though they're not receiving any care at all while they're, they're sitting uh, and waiting, as it were. Uh, we have worked and will continue to work to improve that service. Uh, and on a more medium to longer term uh, uh, strategy, uh, I'm uh, waiting to see what the recommendations from the Health Accord are, because I know um, uh, air and ground ambulance as an integrated system is a topic that interests them. And they have a, a great deal of uh, desire to see uh, an integrated system. So um, those are basically the, the comments I would offer at this stage, uh, Ben. Thank you. Our next questions are from Renel Legro with All Newfoundland Labrador. Renel, please go ahead. Good afternoon. Um, my question is for Minister Haggy. perhaps some clarification um, to your opening remarks there, sir. Um, was it a, a thousand and thirty healthcare workers that are in isolation as of today? Yes, it's one thousand and thirty staff in isolation, of whom only two hundred and twenty-one are actually COVID positive. So, just slightly more than twenty percent. Uh, so, there is potentially uh, eighty percent of those people in isolation who may be in a situation uh, to return to the workforce as early as this weekend. 
And Minister, could you speak further to that and what this is going to mean for the system and getting back to, you know, some normalcy within our uh, hospitals when it comes to staffing levels? Uh, it's going to help. I mean, we have heard very clearly from uh, our labor leaders and we know from our own data that we have, um, as have all health authorities and all jurisdictions across this country, uh, been challenged with uh, um, healthcare workers in terms of both their number and, and their skill sets uh, because of the way people have chosen to change their work patterns uh, and even retire early as a result of the pandemic. So an influx of, you know, seven or 800 workers uh, suddenly uh, and getting back to that on a regular basis is certainly a great boost for uh, the sustainability uh, and uh, resumption of normal services. Our next questions are from Brian Callahan with VOCM. Please go ahead, Brian. Hi. Um, going back to the issue of less reporting of numbers, um, you know, we have comments all the time. Uh, they, we get phone calls right up to two o'clock every day, and we get comments and messages saying stop reporting in some not nice ways. Um, is there a psychological aspect or consideration to less reporting, you know, that it could ease stress or an anxiety that comes with having it in your face every day? Or is there the flip side to that, that out of sight, out of mind might cause people to forget about the precautions? Has that been a consideration in this? Um, certainly, uh, we have heard some of the same, <laughs> some of the same, um, or we have had some of the same letters, I guess, or requests. Um, so I think certainly, uh, you know, that, uh, it does heighten anxiety to see to see that daily reporting, but um, you know when we're doing that, it, we have to have a purpose to doing it, and we want to make sure that uh, you know it, it is serving that purpose well. Uh, and right now, um, you know, really, I'm not sure that it is, and um, it's uh, it's really you know it's here. We have to deal with it. It's uh, it's circulating in the community widely. Uh, and uh, we need to we need to deal with it in the same way that uh, we deal with a lot of other uh, a lot of other respiratory illnesses or respiratory diseases in the community in the winter time. So, uh, you know, we we have influenza that we report on on a regular basis. We do that every week uh, throughout the flu season. We report on influenza, and that's available publicly. Um, so, in in much the same way, I think we're transitioning. So, as we're transitioning through this, we're also transitioning in the way that we, um, you know, we use surveillance to to monitor COVID, and we're transfer, uh, transitioning the way that we report it as well. Thanks. I mean, I can appreciate the relationship to the flu that you said the regular reporting, but I think we can all agree COVID is affects people more than mentally than the flu, I think. But anyway, sorry, second question, and I realize this might be better for the Premier, but we've gotten, again, so many inquiries. Um, we're going to pose it anyway. Many parents, you know, we're hearing their concern that they're still getting charged for daycare when the daycare was shut down because of COVID cases. You know, they had to pay for other arrangements, take time off work, pay daycare costs as well. Um, is that part of, you know, are, are you privy to any of that discussion? Um, I'll probably take that, uh, uh, Brian. Um, the short answer is no. Those would lie with uh, with more properly with education uh, and the Premier's office. Uh, certainly, uh, I think um, uh, freeing up the, the isolation requirements and simplifying them uh, will uh, provide greater clarity for parents and reduce those kind of, of issues. Because certainly uh, we have heard indirectly through healthcare that that is a, a problem for some of the um, uh, the healthcare workers. Um, so I, I can't really answer the question any better than that. Just to chip in on the previous uh, comment uh, or question rather around reporting. Um, I think the other thing is that uh, I did reference redesigning the hub. And I think what you might find is whilst the news releases uh, aren't out there uh, on a frequent basis, for those people who still track figures and these kind of things, that that data will be uh, will be available. It'll just be uh, when you go looking for it, uh, it'll be easy to find uh, rather than us announcing it and publishing it uh, uh, on a piece of paper or in a, an environment like this. Sure. Thanks. Our next questions are from Patrick Butler with Radio Canada. Patrick, please go ahead. Hello. Um, there was a report in the Spanish newspaper um, a little earlier this week 
about several of the bodies of the uh, the ship that went down uh, last week off the coast of Newfoundland, um, which said that there were a number of bodies that were unable to be re repatriated because uh, some of the fishermen had COVID-19. Um, does public health have rules around um, bodies that would have had COVID-19 and, and quarantining bodies? Is, uh, I guess this is a question for uh, uh, Dr. Fitzgerald. Yeah, I, I don't have any information about that. And we don't have any, any uh, regulations or rules about uh, that instant or that uh, situation specifically, but I, I don't have any, uh, any further information on that, uh, uh, on that situation, sorry. That's fine. Um, and my other question is related to uh, um, this idea of uh, dancing being allowed, but with masks. Uh, I'm just curious about the the thought process behind, or the, the I guess the, the the reasoning behind that. Um, you know, we have some sports where you're able to practice them um, without having a mask on. Uh, what's the difference between that and, and, and dancing? Um, I guess to your mind, uh, Dr. Fitzgerald. Um, just uh, you know, if you think about uh, what may be happening on on the dance floors, you know, there's a lot of people who don't know each other coming together. That's a little bit different than a sports team who would be, you know, you would be able to do that contact tracing where you might not be able to do that uh, in a situation of a, of a bar that you're dancing or any, any place really that you're dancing. Um, so it's just really a, a matter of trying to keep the risk of spread down and to uh, uh, try, um, try to reduce that risk and keep that, uh, keep the transmission and uh, spread of uh, COVID at a reasonable level that we can a manageable level, really, I guess, that we can meet. I will now go back through each reporter to see if you have one final question. Andrew Waterman with the Telegram. Do you have a final question? Yes, I do. Uh, it's just uh, something I would, I would like to clarify is for um, uh, Minister Haggy. Um, <clears throat> I had a, an interesting point uh, made to me with regard to the antiviral drug uh, today. I know that one of the conditions is that you have to test positive for COVID-19. Um, I'm not sure how frequently false negatives happen uh, with these tests, but I'm wondering if it's possible that if, if someone, you know, if exceptions would be made for someone to be prescribed the antiviral if all the symptoms are present and they're at risk of severe illness or death, but they tested negative. That's probably a better question to ask an infectious diseases specialist. These drugs are not for everybody. Uh, they have significant side effects uh, and there's a risk to taking them. And there's a risk in these people uh, who are COVID positive for not taking them because of the, the nature of their vulnerability. Um, so uh, in terms of false negatives, um, uh, for symptomatic people, uh, the PCR is pretty good at picking it up. And indeed, the rapid antigen test is better in symptomatic people than asymptomatic people. Um, having said that, you've exhausted uh, my ability to answer your question in any greater depth, and I would direct you really to a, an infectious diseases specialist. But these drugs are not safe for everybody. Thank you. Peter Cowan with the CBC. Do you have a final question? I do, and that's about uh, rapid tests for travelers. Initially, when these rules came out a week ago, it was that testing with rapid tests would be optional. I heard in the preamble today saying that they're no longer be going to be handing out rapid tests at the board, at the ports, points of entry. Can you explain if people who are arriving still want a rapid test, is that still an option and how will that work? Um, so yeah, at the moment we, uh, We've been looking at, uh, you know, the um, just the number of people that are coming in, as well as looking at the spread through uh, the province, and and really the question of uh, importation is, you know, as a significant cause of disease uh, and disease spread at this point is really not we're not seeing that. Um, so uh, at the moment, there won't be any requirement for for somebody to uh, to do the rapid test. And uh, just giving, given, you know, that there would have to be still people there at the airport trying to, uh, you know, uh, reduce the, the number of people that have to be there uh, passing out tests and things like that. And we felt that on the whole, uh, that requirement wouldn't be, uh, 
wouldn't be necessary anymore and we wouldn't be looking to test people who are coming into the province. Ben Cleary with NTV, do you have a final question? I do, I have a question for uh, Dr. Fitzgerald, thank you. Uh, and that's uh, after March 14th or on March 14th, what happens with isolation requirements? Will we kind of see a set standard to follow as we move into an endemic? Yeah, so, you know, isolation, so Kate, what we're calling isolation is what we call in public health case and contact management. Um, and that exists for almost every communicable disease we have out there. Uh, and uh, so we have protocols that we follow for many different diseases. And, you know, sometimes that depends on if you're vaccinated or not, and it can vary. Um, so right now, what we're, uh, I think certainly as time goes on, we will start to transition into a different type of uh, um, management of, of cases and contacts of COVID-19. Uh, but for right now, uh, we think this is going to continue at least for a couple of months. This is what we put forward today. Uh, we'll continue for at least a couple of months and then uh, you know, we'll see from there what's going to happen. But uh, um, there certainly will be, um, for the next little while anyway, some form of case and contact management uh, for COVID-19. Thank you. Renella Gro with All Newfoundland Labrador, do you have a final question? Yes, thank you very much. Um, this is once again for Minister Haggy. I'm wondering how the province's supply of rapid tests uh, is today. Um, not using these at the border any longer, but I know that we're still using them quite a bit, uh, especially among school-aged children. Do we have enough on hand uh, as we sort of transition to using these a little bit more? The short answer is yes. I don't have an accurate number of the inventory at the moment, uh, but uh, I've not been advised of any supply chain issues with rapid tests. I do know we, uh, uh, with um, uh, the uh, emergency operations centre here, are keeping a small provincial depot in case of uh, uh, outbreaks or uh, problems that uh, public health feel they would be useful for. But in terms of the rapid antigen test and the rapid PCR test, I'm not aware of any supply constraints at all. Brian Callahan with VOCM. Do you have a final question today? Yeah, thanks. Just, I guess the last been covered. So broad, just on the broader question for both of you, I guess, what's your professional or your gut instinct of where we are with COVID, you know, the suggestion out there that it doesn't get any worse than Omicron, but, you know, we all know better than assume that. Um, but, you know, how do you feel, not just based on your instinct, but from everything you know? Um, so, I mean, I think at the moment we can only look at where we are with regard to the Omicron wave and, uh, you know, I think we're managing that well at the moment. We are keeping our cases at a manageable level, our hospitalizations are at a manageable level. I feel the public uh, uh, understands uh, what's happening and, and are able uh, to protect themselves and are taking responsibility, um, you know, certainly um, uh, people are taking uh, contact tracing seriously, and, and that's all very good. We know that uh, this virus, like many, many other viruses out there, can uh, go through mutations. And, uh, you know, we may see variants in the future that are more transmissible than Omicron. Uh, they may be more severe. They may cause more severe illness or less severe illness. Uh, and, if, you know, we're going to uh, likely... Um, have waves of, of COVID for the next little while uh, that we'll have to deal with, but those waves may not be as severe as anything that we've seen with Omicron or that other places have seen with other, uh, with other uh, variants throughout the pandemic. So, uh, you know, it's, it's difficult to predict, predict because a lot depends on what this little virus does. And, you know, we, uh, there are those of us out there who thought, oh, Delta was, was it, and then Omicron came on. So, uh, you know, we really just have to maintain our surveillance. That's why it's important for us to be maintaining surveillance, not just on a local level, but on a global level, uh, to be watching things, uh, especially with whole genome sequencing and all of that to, to really help us uh, keep, keep an eye on this and keep track of what's happening. Patrick Thanks. Butler. Patrick Butler with Radio Canada, do you have a final question? No, I'm okay, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, Minister, would you like to make any final comments today? 
Uh, just briefly, uh, so a couple of uh, briefings. These are, are more steps in the opening up process as we respond to the, the change from a kind of a wave to a, a more steady state. Um, I use the term steady state somewhat loosely, uh, bearing in mind Dr. Fitzgerald's previous comments. Uh, but I think there is a need to, uh, to make progress here. There is a need to look after other things in healthcare uh, rather than simply COVID. Uh, and we've heard that and seen that. I think we've done way better than other jurisdictions in doing that. Uh, and I think uh, uh, cautiously optimistic is the best way I would describe things at the moment. So we'll see what these new changes bring uh, and uh, we'll be back again with further update and a further step towards new normal. So thank you everybody for your time. Take care. Thank you, Minister. Thank you everyone for joining us today. Please stay safe and enjoy the rest of your day.